old are you now? You, you I'm quit your let's job. Let's say I'm 23. 23. You quit your job. Mm -hmm. You figured out this whole Facebook thing is going to work, mm -hmm. auctions, mm -hmm. and you're basically giving up the lesson business and you're yep. just flipping horses now. Yes, I'm, I'm buying and selling horses, taking a couple in on consignment for cutting horse trainers. Like, I charge them 10%. Mm -hmm. They send me the horse to sell them. Yep. Um, but, the, but I'm learning a lot of lessons here about, like, how to handle customers, how to handle issues. This is the Problems. part. Yes, this is the part. There was about a two-year deal where I start learning and I'm one of the first people to do it, that every single horse that comes to my house gets x-rayed. Like, I remember getting a couple horses back and having people mad at me, and I hate that. Yes. I do not, I hate, I hate it. I don't want people to be disappointed in, yes. in me or the horse they get. And um, sometimes it was stuff I didn't know. They, like, call me six months later, they're like, this horse is limping, it has a huge OCD in its staff. Why didn't you tell me about it? I'm like, well, I didn't know. Yeah. Well, you exactly. should have known. Well, you, well, then you get the bad rap because you're a horse trader. Yeah. You know, well, you must have known. You yeah. bought it. So I'm like, okay, we're getting rid of that. Yeah. But we, so, like, I've always tried to say, okay, there's a, we can fix every problem, right? So, like, mm -hmm. we, there's always going to be an issue. What do we have to do to fix it? we got to start x-raying every horse. So at that time, I'm like, that's a lot of money. Like, yes, that's $400 a horse or $600, yeah. $4,600. Like, that's a lot. But I'm like, I just think we got to do it. Yeah. So we started doing it. Every single horse starts getting x-rays. Well, that's new. That's yeah, I was just going to say, I don't remember anybody doing that in those no, sales. No, so I, I start with just like everything under five, we do just hawks and stifles. But that at least covers the big parts yeah. of it, right? Yeah. And then over five, we did front feet. Yeah. Okay, so I start doing that. That really helps clarify a lot of issues, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I learn about things like you can't guesstimate that a horse is 15 hands if they're 14 one because people will send them back, yes. you know, things yeah. like that. So I'm learning these lessons. I don't want everybody and to think it's basically called you, you got to get a few bloody noses to figure out how the play works. I got works. A, a, not a lot, but a decent amount. Yes. But I fixed them every time. Yeah. I didn't tell people you're out of luck. Yeah. Because, A, my conscience, I couldn't do like, it. Like that lady that did to you when you were a kid. Yes. She didn't take that call. You, that, ate, you ate the problem. I would never do that yeah. to anybody. Like, I, in, I felt terrible about it. You yeah. know what I mean? So I always fixed it, and I got a good reputation because, like, it was funny. Like, I remember one guy bought this horse from me, and I didn't know what EPM was then, yeah. but I'd bought this two-year-old off of somebody, and it didn't look very good, but it was cheap. Like, yeah. I don't remember. I gave 3000 for it. I sold it for 4500 yeah. or whatever. So that was great. Well, the guy gets it home, and he's like, this thing has EPM, and I don't even know what EPM is, yeah. you know? So, like, that happened a lot, but I took that horse back and said, well, I'll just bring him back, and I'll give you your money back, you know, and I'll mm -hmm. treat him. That guy put a big post on Facebook about, you know, I bought this horse from Melanie, and it wasn't right. He didn't say what was wrong. He said it wasn't right, and she made it right. And, like, I have the utmost respect for her for that, you know. And I'm new to the horse industry still. Like, Did that help you, that post? You have no idea. I love it. Like, it was huge. See, that, that goes with what I always said. You can never put a price on goodwill. Yes. So if you have to eat it yes. and make it work, yes. make it work. So, but, see, what's unique, this is why your business model and mine was so successful, is that... In the horse industry, that's not the norm. Mm -mm. The norm is what that lady did to you. Yes. Say you later. Yes. That's how I developed the signature horse program. Yep. You buy a horse, you got to take it home for 30 fucking days. Yes. You got to look up at skirt for 30 days. Who does that? Yeah. Nobody. They right. might let you take it home for a week or a, a few days, but not a month. Right. And if you didn't like it, bring it back. No questions asked. Right. You know, we probably sold 300 horses in that program over 10 years, mm -hmm. and I might have had... 15 back. It's pretty good. And, and out of those 15, probably eight of them were through divorces. Some lady got at home, got a divorce, <laughs> called me up crying. Yeah. I'm a sucker for a hard luck story. Yeah. Even though I'm a hard ass, I'm a sucker for a crying woman, a hard luck story. Yeah. Bring it back. I'll give you your money back. Yes. So probably only six or seven of them genuinely didn't fit the people. Right. And, and I resold them to people that they did fit with. Right. But that was unheard of. But getting back to, that's a you know, this podcast is about making money and business and life. And that's a key thing I want to hit here is you were doing it and I did it. Never put a price on goodwill. Mm -hmm. And I do believe there's a thing called karma. And mm -hmm. I do believe when you t take care of people, it'll take care of you. Yes. I, about 10 years ago, I had a new customer that came to the ranch when I was in Stephenville. And they bought like a $30,000 yearling out of the pasture. And they had it vetted, so they did, you know, front feet, mm -hmm. hocks, and stifles, mm -hmm. the typical things on a yearling, right. okay? Vets perfectly. Well, about three months later, it's about October now, it's lame in the pasture, walking around three-legged lame. Mm -hmm. 
so we don't know why it's lame. We bring it in, take it to the vet. Well, they x-ray its shoulder blade, and it's got a big old dirty OCD in its shoulder blade, mm -hmm. which is a very rare place to have sure. one. They yeah. can have them there, yeah. but it's not a place you'd look for. It's not right. a place that any You would typically would look x-ray. For. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, so I feel horrible. These are new people to the business, mm -hmm. and this is their first horse they bought for me, mm -hmm. $30,000. Some bitch is laying three months later. I look like an asshole. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I called him up and said, you got one or two choices. Uh, and the vet said it's going to be a pasture pet. It'll right. never be ridden. It'll never be sound. Right. Uh, it'll never come good. And it might even get so lame it has to be put down. Yep. That's how bad it is, okay? Yep. It never even had a saddle on, never been walked, other right. than halter broke. So I said, you, got, you can either come back and I'll give you a $30,000 check back mm -hmm. or come back and I'll just trade you another one. Mm -hmm. No money changes hand. You pick out any yield that's in the pasture, whether it's a $60,000 one or a $10,000 one, straight up horse trade, Yep. whatever you want. They came back and picked out another yield and said, no, we love it. The fact that you're willing to guarantee the horse like this, mm -hmm. this is four months after mine. Sure. I, I had sure. no legal obligation right. to do this at all. Right. The vet had my ass covered. Everybody did the right thing. This yes. is just something in life called bad fucking luck. Yes. And a lot of people in the horse industry don't want to accept that that shit actually happens yes. in life. Like some people get cancer. Yep. It's bad luck. Right. It's not anybody's fault. So they pick a different yearling out. And the lady said, well, what are you going to do with this yearling? And I said, oh, more than likely, I'm just going to have to give it away. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but it's, it's mine. I took it back. They yep. gave me the papers. And she said, well, what about insurance? I have this horse insured. And I said, insurance is not going to pay on this. It's, you know, unless it's insured for loss of use, which is a lot more expensive, right. it doesn't have to be put down. So unless it dies, nobody's going to pay, no insurance is going to pay on this horse. Right. And she said, would you mind if I at least tried? And I said, sure, knock yourself out. Right. She said, don't do anything with it for three months. Would you just leave it in the pasture for three months? Let me have a crack at getting some insurance money. I said, sure. So about two and a half months later, I open up the mail and I got a check for like $27,000 from this lady that bought this horse, this yearling. And I call her up and I said, um, what's this check for? She said, that's your money from that yearling. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, the yearling that was lame, she said, I got the insurance to pay on that horse. Oh my God. And I said, how did you get them to do this? She said, Clinton, I didn't tell you this, but she said, I used to be a lawyer. And she said, I've had my horses insured with this company for 10 years. And she said, I burn a hole in their ass so big, they couldn't wait to get fucking rid of me. <laughs> she said, I just burnt a hole in their ass. And I was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And she said, I harassed them until they paid. I've never had a claim in 10 years. Insurance companies love to take your fucking money. Sure. But they sure as shit hate paying you yep. when it's due. And she said, I burn a hole in their ass. They paid it. Mm. Here's what's special about that. She could have kept that money mm -hmm. and I never would have known Melanie. I gave her a free yearling. Mm -hmm. When I say free, they paid 30, sure. but I gave them another yearling. Mm -hmm. She could have double dipped right. and kept that check. And she said, it's 27,000 because I took out 3,000 for expenses. Yep. I spent some time on this and some yep. legal things and all that kind of stuff. So she said, I took that out of the 30 and here's your 27. That's awesome. That's karma. Yes. That's goodwill. Yep. And I can't tell you how many times in the horse business, me taking horses back has done that to me. Now, you won't see the results straight away, typically. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's difficult to swallow that pill when you have to take it back. And it's an inconvenience and mm -hmm. so forth. But if you will do that and ride or die for that customer, nine out of ten of them will come back and spend a lot more money with you. Yep. The odd arsehole will just wander off. Sure. But nine out of ten of them will appreciate that loyalty, that dedication, mm -hmm. that ethics, that they will die for you like that guy did that post. Yes. So that post helped you, correct? 100%. Yeah. yeah. That was big. So you got, a, you got a taste of taking it back and making it right, made you money. Yes. Correct? Correct. I, I don't well, want to put words in your maybe head. Maybe like he didn't come back and buy one, but I guarantee you other people bought them because of that. Because post. of that, yeah. yes. He did come back and buy horses down the road. Yes. But, um... So yeah, I learn like, okay, it does pay off to take care of people. Now yes. the hard thing Which is- Which is not, let's be honest, and, and I'll take the hate for it, it's not the horse industry. As a tradition. It is not. As a tradition, the horse industry did what that lady did you as a kid. Yes. They tell you you're gonna take it back and then all of a they sudden never lose your number. Yes. That That is tradition. Yes. I'm not proud of it, but that is typically any part of the horse industry. Yes. It's like the wild fucking west. It is. It's not regulated. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not like any other industry that's regulated. Now again, I'm anti-government, so I'm not necessarily wanting regulation. Sure. But, but it, the negative of no regulations is it's a little bit of the old wild west. It is. If you can get away with it, go do it. It is. And, and one thing that also taught me 
was the very beginning of, okay, I probably need to learn about these contracts, like yes. bill of sale. I didn't have an LLC. Yeah. I didn't have, I didn't even know what LLC was, mind yeah, you, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, I'm 23 years old, I know nothing about that. I just closed on my first property and I, it's all foreign to me. Like all of the business part of it. I went to nursing school, I don't know how to run a business. Yes. I'm trying to do this on QuickBooks. When I say I'm winging it, yeah. winging it is an understatement, yeah. okay? I. Ha start saying, oh, I guess I'm going to have to pay taxes yes. or something. And so then I'm like trying to get this stuff to the CPA and he's like, what is this? And yeah. I'm like, I don't know. What is it supposed it's a to shoe be? shoebox full of cash. I don't know. Like, <laughs> this is, this, you said you wanted the books. I don't know you're what like that even means. You're like Pablo. You just show up with three <laughs> containers full of cash and say, don't ask where God it God bless us <laughs> for CPA that had to take care of all my stuff because I know he was like, this girl is an idiot, you yeah. know? So that it was a really bumpy part of starting this business was I didn't go to business school. So I'm like reading blog posts about like how to pay taxes, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I guess I have to get a CPA. I can't file them. I don't yeah. know what any of this means. And so I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm straight up winging it, but it works fine. Good enough. We get through it. Okay. So then I get to the point we built another barn and we're like building on this place all the time. We have yeah, like, you're still with your first I'm husband. I'm still with my first yeah, husband. Yeah. We've built this other barn. He wants to train cutting horses. I'm like, whatever. I don't mm -hmm. really want to ride cutting horses, yeah. but I think this is great. So yeah. whatever. I, he supports what I want to do the best he can. So I try to be supportive of what Fair he's enough. doing. Okay. So we have some cutting horses and all that. And we get this place kind of built and it's done. Okay. We've got an arena. We've got one stall barn with four stalls I've made into 12 and another one with like 12 stalls. And I'm like, so um, this place isn't big enough anymore, you know? So I'm like, and he's like, it's fine. And I'm like, it's not, like, it's not enough. Like Biggie's we have- got to be better. Okay, we've got to have better and bigger. So, <laughs> so you I- been You should have been born a man. I, I start looking for a place and I find this place in Burt Burnett that's been on the market for a long time. Mind you, like, I know quite a bit about real estate now. I know nothing about it then, nothing. I'm completely yeah. green as a gourd. So I see this place and they have it priced for like 1.2 million. And I'm like, okay, the payment would be whatever it was. I don't know, 3,000 yeah. a month. I'm like, I don't know if I can do that, but man, that place is cool. It's like a big, nice house, which the house wasn't really that cool to me, but it was like a hundred acres right in town. This was uh, in Burke Burnett, Texas. So right by Wichita Falls. And there was like a 20 stall barn and it was a racehorse barn. It was a really nice barn. And then they have all these pins everywhere. Cause I've learned about trading brood mares. And I think this is like the greatest thing ever. Like yeah. we buy these mares and I bought a stud. The very first stud I have is hired gun. And I'm like, I buy these mares. I put them with the breed and I sell them. They make some money. Okay, this is great. Now we have to get in the breeding business. Okay, so I've learned about trading brood mares and some yearlings. Now, just to backtrack just a little bit. The first time I get a mare to sell, I'm like, nobody buys brood mares. You know, mm. like nobody's gonna buy brood mare or yearling. And then I sell this broodmare for like 16,000 and I think I've hit the lottery. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, people really do buy broodmare. So that's how that part of that business starts. And then I buy that stud. Okay. So anyways, I'm looking at this place thinking, oh, I can have a little breeding program here. I don't even know about breeding. Like the, when I bought a stud uh, six years ago, it's probably about what it's been five, six years ago. I remember calling Jaff that was going to stand my stud. I know nothing. Yeah. Okay. And I'm like, hey, um, I made this ad for Hired Gun. Can you look at it and make sure that I have everything right on there? Because I think I understand what a shoot fee is, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So I send it to him and it says, we are going to ship fresh frozen semen. And he's <laughs> like, I think this fresh looks Kentucky really good. Fresh Kentucky Fried Chicken, frozen <laughs> like, though. Well, the fresh semen isn't frozen semen. Like it's either fresh semen or it's frozen semen and we're shipping fresh semen. So just delete the frozen thing. And I'm like, okay, you know, That's, like I'm so, I'm green. That's I okay. have no idea. This is what people love. Remember I told you about being genuine and authentic? Yeah. Right now, people listen to this laughing their ass off yeah. at you and me, I and, and they love that because yes. when you're willing to be genuine and authentic, yes. we all pull our pants up the same way. Yes. We all have accidents from time to time, mm -hmm. and, and when, you're, when you're willing to admit that, yeah. that you started like that, it mm -hmm. makes you more endearing. People yes. love it. And I, I just didn't know, you know, and, and so I am literally, once again, the story of my life at this point and still now a lot of times is I'm just winging it. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that a shoot fee is what they use to collect them. Yeah. So I'm like calling them like, do I have to type up this contract? Cause I don't even, and they're like, 
no, 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 we have the contract. So I get the contract, I build a website for the stud, I put the contract on there, start reading and seeing how other people are doing it. And I'm like, why do these people, why do you have to email a breeding barn for a contract? Why can't we just put it on the website? You know, so I'm like, Jeff, I'm gonna put them on the website. Oh, that's great. You know, I'm like, I wanna make this easy. This is crazy yes. to me. So start figuring out some of that. Okay, back to the real estate. So I'm looking at this place and my ex-husband, or husband at the time is like, you are an idiot we cannot afford a $1.2 million place. Yeah. I'm like, well, I think we might be able to. Like, yeah. I just feel like we might be able to. <laughs> so I have a realtor friend that goes and shows it to us. And I'm like, I'm buying this place. Like, I just want you to know that I'm going to figure out a way to buy this place. So just stop right there. You just said a key word right there. <laughs> Ian Francis has a famous saying that's at the bottom of every one of my emails. Mm -hmm. If you want something bad enough, you will find a way. Yes. And if you don't, you'll find an excuse. Yes. And what you just said is, I don't know how I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to buy this place. Yes. When you want something bad enough, you will find a way. Yes. It wasn't clear to you how you were going to buy it. Right. It wasn't clear to you how you were going to pay for it, mm -hmm. but you knew it was going to happen. Yes. You have to have that resolution. Yep. When you want something, you better be committed to it like that. And Otherwise, the, there's too many excuses. We can't afford yes. it. What happens if you break your leg? What happens if the economy goes bad? What mm -hmm. if this? What if that? What if that? I would say 80% of humans are what ifs. They just don't have the balls to jump. Mm -hmm. They're what ifs. What mm -hmm. if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if this goes wrong? Mm -hmm. And and that's one of the uh, the funny things and it's a weird time in your life in that, tw in that decade of 20 to 30 Typically, you just got balls of steel. You just yeah. you're just willing to jump. You just I just was like I'm I don't have do it. it anymore. At yeah. 47, I don't take anywhere near the financial risks yeah. that I did in that decade. Yes, I think because when you acquire enough, then you don't want to lose it. Right. When you're young, you're kind of broke and I'm you like, don't have much to risk. Yeah. So you feel like <laughs> fuck it. You know, I got to jump. What yeah. am I going to lose? Yes. But I love what you just said. I don't care what how it happens. I'm going to buy this. Yes. French yes. and there's a lot of power in saying that you yes. will figure out the details Doug Coven taught me that one of our mentors he always said when I found the right horse I just buy it yes and I said well what happens if you didn't have the money to buy it did you did you wait till you found a buyer to find the horse he said no when I found the right horse I bought it on the spot yes I said do you have the money sometimes he said no nope, sometimes I didn't have the money yes. but he said when I have the right horse one thing always happened the right buyer showed up yep. within a week when I bought the right horse on the spot Hundred thousand dollars. I don't have a hundred thousand in the bank. Within a week, the right owner showed up with one hundred and fifty to resell it. He is absolutely because, right about great horses yes. too. Yes, when, will they, show when up. they're a great one, you don't wait around because yes. if you wait around, somebody else is going to buy it. Yes. You know, you know, we put a little thing, funny thing on our Facebook the other day. Rochelle did, and it said, some, it said. Um, uh, just go ahead and buy that horse. I, no, I saw it, and no it was point, great. No point being the richest bitch in the 100%, cemetery. Yes. Yeah, go go ahead and buy that horse. No yeah. point being the richest bitch in the cemetery. Yes. Which is when it's the right horse, mm -hmm. go buy the son bitch. Yes. Because buying the cheap one and it's flipping over backwards and rearing up and running into a fence is going to half kill you. No point being dead in the cemetery, but yep. you save seventy five hundred dollars. Yes. yes. Absolutely. That's funny. Okay, yeah. so you buy this place then. So I call this loan officer and I'm like, you're going to think I'm crazy. Okay. I have done everything I can not to pay taxes the last two years. However, I haven't submitted my tax returns for last year and I could make it look like that we've made a decent amount of money. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, obviously, usually my goal is to write off as much yeah. of the expenses as possible. But I think this year I could just not write off as many expenses and show the income you need, yeah. you know, because we have made pretty good money that year. Yeah. They're really good money. Yeah. It's the first year. It's made good money. Like, mm -hmm. because we, we had spent all the money back on that place building on it. But that still is profit, yeah. you know. And so he's like, and God bless this guy, because he's like, if you will do it, like, if you'll listen and you can get me hooked up with your CPA and I can explain to him the income we need to show, you know, it's all there on your bank statements. We just have to make sure that we show it the right way on your on your um yeah whatever it is, tax returns. And you know, he doesn't need to write off all the depreciation he usually would and you'll yeah. be fine. And so I said, okay, so we do that. It was the most stressful 60 days of my entire life because yeah. they're asking me for all this stuff. And he's like, I need a profit and loss. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Can I find it on Google? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, there's Google. I mean, you can download a profit and loss. And I'm like, okay, well, so I get on there and I'm like typing in the 
profit, sold these horses, loss, uh, saddle. Uh, like it's not. <laughs> Mexican okay. stole the saddle. Uh, everything. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know that QuickBooks will do this for you. Like yeah. that's how green I am. I think I have to get out and type this out. So I spend like three days locked on my office, like highlighting and adding things up on a little calculator to make a profit and loss because I don't know that this exists. See, in this Excel. is a great example. When I said in your twenties, you've got so much. You're stupid. I was so dumb. So, you've got so much <laughs> energy. Yes, I was that, committed to that it. That you're willing to sit there for sixteen hours and do this shit. And I was like so excited. Like I just remember. Like that's when you feel like you're life right yeah. you're like I think I could do this like it's actually a little bit obtainable yeah so I was thrilled to be able to try to figure all this out so I get with my CBA we figure all this out he finally explains to me that I can get in QuickBooks and do this so then I make a real profit and loss <laughs> after like 30 hours on my handwritten <laughs> And I'm sure it was all wrong. Your abacus. It was terrible. <laughs> You're fucking with an abacus. Literally. <laughs> and so, um, so anyways, I make the profit and loss and get it to this guy. And he's like, okay, well, I think we can swing this, but we have to divide it into like a commercial loan and a residential loan. And I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, that's fine. So Sounds good. long story short, these poor bankers and the CPA are dealing with me. I'm a complete idiot. I don't know what even the vocabulary they're using is, but I'm like, we're buying this. Yes. Okay. So we make it happen. Out. So like one day before we're, set, okay, so backtracking, I bet I'm like 800,000 on this place with all the equipment. It was just like the perfect storm because the guy, unfortunately for them, had just had a heart attack and they had to get out of that place. Like, so they took it. What and were they like, asking for? 1.2? 1.2. And it had been on the market for a while. Real estate wasn't great then, you know, but this place, like looking what back. What was this? This was in 2020, I'm sorry, not 2020. This was in like maybe 2016. 2017 okay, right. so real estate was fine but it wasn't mm -hmm. like yeah but I was like man I there's oil wells on it and I'm like well maybe we can do something with them to get the oil you know I don't really know how that works either so I like write up this thing like a little bill of sale like okay they like we go back and forth about something I don't some inspection like something maybe the roof had needed some yeah. stuff done and I'm like well how about this you guys don't even have to do the roof we'll just split the profit on the oil and they're like the lady's like because we're like into it deep. And I'm like, I think she'll just do it because they just have to get out. So they say yes. Oh my. So I like write a bill of sale for this. Okay. I, that's not how it works, obviously. Yeah. But I like type it up and I sign it and she signs it. And it says like, after closing, you will get 50% of the oil and we'll get 50%. And I'm like, okay, great. So anyway, so um, we like one day before we're supposed to close, the guy calls me. He's like, okay, you're clear to close. And it was like, that was probably, besides trying to pass NCLEX, was the greatest day of my life. That's awesome. Because there was just so much stress. I was like, I wanted it so bad. And I just knew it was the next step for my business. And like, I felt like having that place would make me more authentic to the public, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, or maybe not authentic, like. More professional. Yes, thing. like I wanted them to believe in me. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like you have to fake it, right? You like you just, yeah. I, I couldn't afford that place. But I was like, I just feel like if I have it, when Most people pull in. Most women I've ever slept with have believed the same thing. <laughs> I faked it and they eventually find out. <laughs> it. But anyway, keep going. And so I'm like, but when they pull in this place, they're going to want to buy a horse because they feel like we know what we're doing, you know? And so. First impressions. Yeah. yeah. And it's a big, cool place. Like you drive over a big pond with a concrete bridge, big trees. I mean, it's a cool place. That's awesome. And so it needed a little work. Like it was a little, but not bad. Mm. So I get it. And like, I am, I don't even know if I've ever been as excited as I was then. That's like awesome. that was the greatest day ever. So we get it, move into it. I get my other place sold. It all works great. Um, Did it help your business? Tenfold. First of all, I could have more horses, right? Then I'm like, it's Cause time Cause you're in to the go. inventory business. You need horses to sell. You have to have fruit to have a fruit stand. Yeah, okay. Right. So, and then I'm like, I can do more. I have time to do more. Right. And I've learned, I can start hiring some people to help me. Like I would hire a girl. That was a big deal for me to have one salary. Oh, yeah, I, right? remember, I remember my first employee. It's yeah, a big deal. I'm like I, I need Yeah. When you have an, when you finally get your first employee, it's yeah, a big deal. Cause big you're deal. usually broke. Yeah, I was That's broke. That's why you're doing everything yourself. I couldn't afford them, but yes. I'm like, I really, I, I know it's time to get another employee yeah. well then I'm like okay well um I know that my time is better spent picturing and videoing horses than cleaning stalls so I need to hire somebody to clean stalls so then I'm like I know my time is better spent only doing pictures and videos so I need to hire somebody to lope horses yeah so I learn like about my time, time. management yes. yes and I'm like I know what my time is worth like I can make it make more money that's that because that's what you've ultimately you know now you figured out that your time is limited 
Very. And you figured out that you can only touch so many things. Yeah. And so I'm, you're trying to duplicate your time as best you can. And also, like, I started learning, like, I am not good at some things. Yeah. Like bookkeeping. Yes. Okay. So I'm like, I am better off paying somebody to do what I'm not good at and doing what I'm good at. I, I've had, I've always had that philosophy yeah. early on. Yeah. Um, because I'd rather pay the plumber to do what he knows how to do. Yes. Because I can make more money than the plumber. Yes. So I'm going to do what I do. And I know. Because even though I could do what the plumber does, I'd fuck it up. Yes. I'd ruin it. I'd mm -hmm. be frustrated. It wouldn't be as good a job. Yep. And I'd screw the whole thing up. 100%. A and by the time I finally get it right, I could have made three times the amount of money or five times doing what I do. And the I've horse business I've always is been guilty of that. Like that. The um, horse business is the worst about it. Yeah. The horse trainers want to do all their own stuff. Yeah. You could take one more horse and pay somebody to do all your other And do things. it better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's, yes. And not be miserable. And not be miserable. You hate, exactly you know, right. and so, um, so that was a big lesson that I started learning there because there was a lot to do there. And yes. then I learned I had to mow it and I had to oh, weed it. Yes. And I needed to spray the pastures. So that was a lot. That was There's a big a lot. That's, learning curve. People ask me that about, you know, when I moved to Arkansas, I went from 250 acres down to 11. Yes. And they often looked at me and said, well, why would you do that? And I said, you have no idea of the freedom. No, nobody knows they, until you have one. When you, especially the way I keep ranches yes. and you keep ranches, yes. we keep ranches looking like golf courses. Yes. We keep them looking sexy, trimmed up, mm -hmm. short and curlies, everything's good to go. Yes. Um, now you can let things get overgrown pretty quickly and look like shit, but I could never stand my properties to look like that. Well, but and you wouldn't make a good, as good of the first impression. People need to look and be like, man, these people have it together. Yes. Yeah. And so I, when going down to 11 acres, it's so easy to take care of. Yes. Yes. You know, I went from 40 employees down to eight. Right. And that's you huge. Get when I, it's huge. The stress yeah. release is unbelievable. Yes. Um, the, 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 you know, again, we're different parts of our careers and businesses, but you have to get big to eventually get small. Mm -hmm. And I don't regret getting big, yeah. but it was time for me to get small again. Yes. You're still in that getting big stage. Yes. You're still in that growing stage. Right. But, and I've told you this privately, I've always said, be careful about big too. Because mm -hmm. big almost sent me bankrupt one yes. year too. Because you can get away, this animal can get away from you so fucking quickly. Yes. But by the time you realize the son bitch is out of the stall, it's about three miles down the road. It ain't just hanging around around the barn waiting to be caught. It's down the road three miles, mm -hmm. and it's a lot to get it caught back up again. Hundred uh, percent. That, especially as my advice to you, Melly, for what it's worth, as you get bigger and the money gets bigger, you must keep your head around that a lot. Yes. You must keep your finger on it, and you must manage it because I was always stupid enough to believe it was the gross. I got, I got to, if I did ten million this year, I got to do eleven next year. Got to do 12 the next year. Got to do, I was mm -hmm. always got to make more money. Got to make, Now I always say, well, what is the net? Yes. I don't look at the gross anymore. I don't yep. care what the gross is. Yep. Now I pay attention, what's the net? Yep. What are we making? What are we making? What are we making? Mm -hmm. Where in my younger years, it was always big is better. You know, mm -hmm. guys, we all got bigger dick syndrome. We've mm -hmm. got to get bigger. We've got to get bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's true to a point. Mm -hmm. But there is a point where that cross section crosses where bigger actually cripples you. Yes. You, you, your quality goes down, your stress level goes through the roof. Yes. You know, I can't tell you how many businessmen said to me, you know, when my business was 25 million a year, I netted this much money. When it went to 50 million a year, I doubled in size and I netted less and had twice as much stress. Right. That's what I'm talking about. There's yes. a line there mm -hmm. that you have to understand where it is. You know, mm -hmm. in the horse industry, a, a typical line is most trainers will tell you 25 horses that are in training is about the line. Mm -hmm. You know, the net profit of 25 is not much different from the net profit of 50. Yep. But when you take 50 horses in training, you need two more saddlers, two more riders, two more guys mm -hmm. cleaning stalls. So, and with all that comes the management and the stress and, and the shit of dealing with humans. Yes. You know, absolutely. I personally got burnt out on humans more than even my business yes. is, the, is the employees and the humans is what burnt me out. Is, yes. is I felt like I was in professional daycare. I was just managing fucking people. And I think that's business And, and, and trying to keep people showing up, yes. functioning, trying to keep everybody from you know, pulling each other's eyes out and, right. and so forth. But anyway, so keep going. So you got this place, your business is doing good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's doing really well. Um, buying and selling a lot of horses. We have a horse trainer in there now. So we have a new deal where like, if you buy a two year old, you can leave it there and we'll ride it. Uh -huh. um, we have a horse trainer in and it's going really well. Um, 
now there's a lot more stress because there's like we put the bed on the table now right like we have to pay that payment and you got to pay all the salaries so we've gone from a little place with no payment to a big place with a big payment so you're uncomfortable but it, I wouldn't call it uncomfortable because for me it just made me get up every morning well when I mean, what do I mean by uncomfortable I mean when you're uncomfortable, you don't have a choice to stop. I don't have a choice. Like when I was when I was in my deepest and down on a horsemanship, I got six million in debt. Mm -hmm. I'm fucking burnt out. Yeah. I want to quit. Yeah. Honestly, mm -hmm. I want to throw it in and go to fucking Walmart and push a broom at three o'clock in the morning down the aisle and sweep yep. an aisle by myself and listen yep. to my iPhone. Yep. You know iPods. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, but when you're six million in debt, you just don't walk away from that. Yeah. You're committed. Yeah. So that's what I mean by uncomfortable. So yep. there's a certain level of debt. That is what makes you get out of bed every fucking day. Absolutely. And it's actually a little bit of my Achilles heel right now mm -hmm. is I'm not in debt anymore. I, I had a vow not to be debt free, but it's a little bit of my Achilles heel too. Because I'm comfortable, I'm a tad bit lazy now. Yes. You know, I get to the barn at eight. I yeah. leave at four. Right. I'm half fucked off during the day. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I'm not. I the tiger anymore. Yes. Because, and I see that in kids that come through the academy. The kids that come from the wealthiest parents mm -hmm. typically are the laziest little pricks. Right. Not always. Right. But Not I'd typically. say 80% of the time. Right. The kids that come from poor backgrounds, like you, when I say yours, you, you know, you had to work for everything you got. Yes, I had to work for You it. had to be hungry. Yes. There was an uncomfortable feeling. Yes. You couldn't make your next move without selling some bales of hay. Right. So that uncomfortableness is what makes you get out of bed. Right. You know, so being in debt in some ways is good because mm -hmm. it's what makes you deal with that bullshit pain mm -hmm. in the ass customer mm -hmm. where you really want to tell them to fuck off, Absolutely. but you have to swallow it and say, yes, ma'am, I'd love to do that for you. Yep. What else can I do for you? Is there sure. anything else you do? And really want to blow your brains out. But you're thinking of that mortgage payment mm -hmm. that, that she might be making next month. That and she, truck payment and trailer and truck, payment. And that's exactly right. So, so I get, that's what I mean by being uncomfortable. Yes, There's and, a certain level definitely. of being uncomfortable that you have to be to grow. And, and I, I, you know, you always hear the rumors. People think, oh, well, they must have a backup. I yeah. don't have a backup plan. No. There's no trust fund. There's no rich husband. And see, that's your greatest asset. It's great. I would yes. not ever go back and wish that my parents handed it to me. Like, I am so grateful that they were able to support me the way they were, but they weren't able to give me money to do it. Yes. And I would never change it. And I, and I want hope parents that listen to this, the podcast, listen to what you just said. Yep. They supported you, but you had to go do it. Yes. They didn't buy it. Yeah. The kids that are the most heartless in the academy, they got their money from their grandparents. They got their money from their mom and dad. The kids that came through that had three jobs mm -hmm. to pay for the 20 grand yes. to come to the academy usually work a lot harder. Well, and like my dad would say, like, he when he tells somebody about, you know, whenever I grew up, he said, because I played softball and I was a mm -hmm. pitcher, and I was a decent pitcher, yeah. and um, my dad really enjoyed it. So it's kind of like what we did together. I did the private lessons, and he said, you know, when I finally did quit when I was 16, I had to get knee surgery after an accident in softball, and he said, you know, I had to force you to go practice softball. I never, ever one time had to tell you to go feed your horse. That's right. You know, and, and he was like, I, it doesn't matter. I wanted you to to love softball or dirt bikes or whatever, but you loved horses. And I never had to force you to go do that, you know? And so as a parent, I hope that they see that if, you know, I feel like parents get blindsided by either we want our kid to win, especially horse parents that have horse kids. Mm -hmm. We want our kid to win, so we buy them the best horse. Well, you're crippling your kid probably. Yes, you are. You know, you're handicapping them. You are absolutely For your right. own selfish enjoyment yes, a lot of exactly times. Right. You know, I think there's a fine line of they need to learn to ride a good horse, but I had a lady tell me when I was 16, if you'll learn to tra like, train those horses those parents are buying, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. You need to be the person that's training the horses they're buying for the kids that cost 100000 That's exactly And right. that's why, that's what I lived off of, and I wanted to train barrel horses to do well, that. Raising a kid um, is in poverty is definitely hard to do, mm -hmm. and it's a detriment. Yep. But also, believe it or not, raising a kid with ultra wealth is a detriment. Yes. There is a somewhere middle ground in there mm -hmm. where it works the best. Yes. Where you need to have enough resources as a parent for food, clothing, love, shelter, right. education. Right. But once you cross that line into luxury, mm -hmm. it can really hurt those kids Absolutely. a lot. And it's easy for me to be objective about this because I don't have kids. Right. So, you know, one lady said to me sometimes, sometimes she said, you don't have the fairy dust. And I said, well, what's the fucking fairy dust? And she said, when you have a kid, when it's born, 
there's a fairy up there that just pours this fucking dust on you and you're laying in the hospital and it pours this fairy dust on you. Mm -hmm. And the fairy dust makes you delusional about some shit about your kid. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you think it's the greatest kid in the world and it's the ugliest motherfucker in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think it's smart and it's dumb as a bag of rocks. You yep. know, it's, that's fairy dust. Sure. And she said, we all got it. Grandparents yeah. especially got this yeah. shit. Parents have got it. She said, you don't have fairy dust on you. Yeah. So you get to see the world through clear lenses. And that's a great point. And yeah. she said, the rest of us, it's not our fault, but we love our kids, but with that love comes a little fucking fairy dust. Right. Where we're delusional about their abilities, what they can do, what they can't do, what we want them to do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that is where they want to protect their children from the struggles. It's the struggles that make them great human beings. Yes. I didn't have a plan B when I came to America. $400, mm -hmm. a fucking pair of boots, and a bridle. Yes. There's no plan B. There's no inheritance. There's no nothing. That's pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that I don't have any children is what drove me to get my money together because I didn't want to die alone right. in a single wide trailer. Right. I wanted to die in a nursing home with some bitch wiping my ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like I didn't want to die poor. Yes. That pressure of dying poor is what made me get my shit together. Mm -hmm. I didn't have... And no backup. No then. backup. That's None of my key. family live here. Yeah. I don't have children. You know what I mean? And people say, you know, I've often heard this excuse. Well, when you have children, that's who's going to take care of you. Bullshit. They don't I've know. seen so many parents that have got children that couldn't give a rat's ass about them when they're old in a nursing home. Yep. Now, some kids are unbelievable. Sure. They'll be right there to the end sure. taking care of their parents. But don't think just because you have offspring that that little son bitch is going to be there wiping your ass. <laughs> I, I plan to be on a good nursing home with some bitch with a power washer that's at least lukewarm. <laughs> So she'll power wash me down lukewarm. <laughs> but I'm planning on that. Mm. But anyway, moving on. But again, parents, listen fucking hard. Yeah. You know, parents laugh at me. What the fuck would you know about raising kids you don't have any? True. But I sure raised your little assholes once you got yeah. done with them. Yes. I got, I got them after 18. Right. And I can tell you without a doubt, the kids that had to toe the line and mm -hmm. didn't come from rich families typically worked harder. Not yep. always. There's but never, typically. But typically. Yes. 80% of the time. Yeah. There's, there's the rare few that came from wealthy families that their mother and father made them toe the line mm -hmm. and pulled their finger out of their ass and they were great kids. Yes. But I, I can just tell I've got them after. See, when I get them off through the academy and through my apprenticeship program, when I get them after 18, I'm kind of stuck with them. Yeah. I, I don't get to mold them that well anymore. Right. You better mold these little son bitches early. Mm -hmm. Get them shaped up early because by the time they're 18, they've got so many habits, it's hard to break some of this shit. Yes, absolutely. Okay, moving on. That's my fucking parent rant. Okay, <laughs> so moving on. So you got this place, business is going good, you got mm -hmm. your first stud, where yeah. are you thinking of making the next million? What's going so on? So then I buy another stud, I buy Metallic Malice. He ends up being homeless, I guess, Roan. And that was the first homozygous roan by Metallic Cat that was yep. to be found. Huge deal, right? Like Color. I mar yeah, I market him. He's a really nice horse. We get him shown decent. He yep. comes to us as a four year old, but a good, good like had we have had him as a two year old, would have had a completely different Fair enough. You know, but we didn't. And yep. so we worked with what we had and um he bred a lot of mares and I was like, Okay, this stud business, like, all right, I like it. And then I start breeding some mares, so I learn, start learning about the breeding. I have a lady See, that comes over. See, you're a over. fucking natural pimp. I... That's you are a natural <laughs> pimp, bitch. I'm telling you right now. You pimp the kids out. You pimp the ponies out. You fucking pimp the hay broker out. Uh, now you're pimping studs out. Yes. I fucking love it. So, love it. So the stud deal is really good, and I'm like, I'm breeding these mares to these studs and selling them in full, <laughs> and that's the next great thing. I'm like, I can buy these mares open. I have a lady that's good at breeding that comes to my house in Burt Burnett and breeds them for me. And so then I start learning about that, which once again, I, completely foreign to me. They're like, oh, this mare's going to ovulate. I'm like, oh, okay. Does that mean she's pregnant? Or <laughs> Love no, it. she's not pregnant. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's great. Get you know? this bitch knocked up. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, but what's the next one I need to bring to you to check? So I have no idea about this. And mind you, this is like five years ago. So like, it's funny because some people call me and they're like, well, I know you've been in the breeding business a long time. And I'm like, yeah, I have, you know, or I don't say I have, but I'm like, yeah, you know, and I'm like, actually I haven't, you know, mm. it's just, I, to be completely honest with everybody, I had no clue what uh, frozen semen was, what O sites were but what makes five you, years what ago. What makes you so special is you're willing to learn it. Yes. And I was hungry. Like you're I hungry. wanted to learn it. Hungry. And you I, I enjoyed it. And, and it, 
and one thing that I think is a blessing about that too is like when people come to me and they're like, we want to ICSI a we don't know what it is. I was in their place, like I didn't grow up with it. So it's easy for me to talk to those people and it walk them through those yes. things because I know how they don't you, understand. You don't talk down to them. No. Yes. I'm like, I tell you the other advantage of you being green and not knowing a lot is you come into an industry that's established with an open mind. Mm -hmm. So you get to see holes. Let's, just like you said, why are we mailing out contracts yeah. when we can just put them on the web? Why? Yeah, absolutely. From an outsider looking in, you're like, fucking duh. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that? Sure. It and then I'm sure the breeding manager said, yeah, that's a pretty good fucking idea. I don't know 100%. Why. I'm sure Jack would have said, why didn't we do that? We mail them. Well, right now we put them in a deal and we mail it to them. We put a stamp on it and then they mail it back. <laughs> I'm like, we're not in 1995. What are y'all doing? Yes. You know? Yes. So, they, but that's the horse industry. Yeah, and it they really were, is. They were kind of like, uh, uh, you're you're gonna put a link to them? Like, okay. But then they're but Jack was really good at like working with me on my but crazy you, you ideas. You get what I'm saying? Your ignorance was was good because it, it gave you fresh eyes. That's why I get out of the horse industry. Mm -hmm. When I want to go to the next level mm -hmm. and I want to change my marketing and I want to do shit that's different, mm -hmm. I don't stay here. Yes. I go to fucking automotive, I go to SEMA, I go to Which automotive expos, I go to high-end yachting, like billion dollar fucking yachts. Yes. I go all over the country and out of the country too, to big expos mm -hmm. for three, four days. And I just walk around with my phone, taking photos of shit, voicemails of mm -hmm. shit. I just get out of my world. Right. Because I want to see what's cutting edge in the real world and, yep. and then bring it back to the horse industry, which is 30 years behind everywhere else at yep. best. Yes. Absolutely. At best. Yeah. That I don't stay in the horse industry for innovation. Yes. Get the fuck out of it. Yep. yep. For innovation. Yep. I don't know why we're like this as an industry, but we ha are. We have always been like this and yes. it'll always stay like this. It's yes. slow to change. It so is. your ignorance was almost a blessing because yes. it got it gave you clear eyes to see what's out there. Yes. And talk to people. Like there I was appealing to people that had never bred a mare with a stud that was ship semen, right? They'd always live covered. So yeah. I'm like, okay, well I can explain the process to you kind of now. You know, I kinda know what's yeah. going on the first year. So anyway, so that goes on for a year or two. Um, I get the deal with the oil deal with this lady. And back to that, so we figure out then that you can't split oil like that, like off a little bill of sale. The oil place is like, that's not how it works. I'm like, well, I don't know. How does it work, you know? And they're like, well, you have a lawyer. We normally flip a coin. That's yeah. how it works. <laughs> so they're like, you're going to have, so I'm like, tell this lady, I'm like, um, I, I got to buy you out of these oil rights. So what do you want for them? So she charges me like 13 grand or something. It was pure luck, like pure luck. So we signed the deal. I get a little lawyer to put something together that's still really simple, but I, I tell her I'll pay you $500 a month until it's paid off and I'll try to pay you more when I can. So that's what we put in our little deal and I get it. And then the oil goes up and that thing starts making like $4,000 a month. It's and I'm like, awesome. oh my God, like this is like, we're You're gonna, like the we're gonna be millionaires. <laughs> I mean, it you're moving to Beverly Hills. Yeah, Fuck I these horses. We're like, out of here. This is amazing, you know. So anyway, so that was cool, and and it was just an extra bonus with this mm -hmm. land. And then I like start getting a little intrigued by real estate, and I'm like, I think we could split some of this land up, you know, like, but but let's not yet. Like maybe one day we could split this up, build yeah. some houses on it. All right. So anyway, so that all goes on. Well, then it kind of my relationship kind of gets a little rocky, and then you know him and I decide to part ways. Yep. Clinton's grabbing a cocktail, and we'll be right back. Get yourself one and enjoy this short clip. And that's why you've got to surround yourself with friends that will tell you you're being a cocksucker, will tell you you're an idiot. And I've been lucky enough that I've surrounded myself with people that will call, call me out on my bullshit. I remember Ken Bray one time, he's a great friend and a mentor to me, kind of brother figure, a mentor, called me up one day when I was in my insane days of working. And he said, I need you to slow down a little bit. He said, y you're sitting on a three-legged stool. A three-legged stool only works because one, all three legs are on it. If one of those legs break, you're fucked. You're working extreme hours. I think you're going to get burnt out. I think you're going to be hurt yourself and you're going to do some stupid shit. And he got me right at that right time because I was drinking too much. I was working too much. I was doing some shit that wasn't real healthy for my life. And he recognized that and I, I took heedance in that. I valued what he said to me. So I pulled back a little bit and got a little bit of balance there. So you need people in your life that are willing to say, hey, you're being a cocksucker. Oh, hey, you, congratulations, you knocked it out of the park. Do it again. You can't be surrounded by yes men. You gotta be surrounded by people that'll call out your bullshit. 
if, if needed, and, and you respect it enough to listen to it. I'm not saying you have to agree, but you at least respect it, listen to it, and then you got to be around people that will support you. Okay, so uh, we decided to split up, and I take my studs, a little credit card debt, and my car that was not paid off, and um, off I go. I have no horse trailer. I called friends. I'd come get everything. And so here, you went hardcore. You went full retard. You just got out. Like how I said earlier, like I just think about it for like an hour and then I'm like, okay, that's enough. Like yeah. I just had had enough. We had tried a little bit of the counseling and stuff and it just wasn't working. And like I said, we just grew apart. He mm -hmm. was not a bad person. That's exactly. We right. just grew apart. That's all there was to that's it. That's exactly. And, and, and I will say that from my first wife. Yeah. We were 21. I was 21 when I got married. She was 18. Yeah. We didn't know the difference between love and lust. We were just stupid kids. Yes, absolutely. That's all we were, stupid yeah. kids. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't my yes. fault. We were stupid kids. She wasn't a horse person. We yep. had nothing in common. Yep. She wanted the, the, the white picket fence and three kids and be the fucking soccer mom in a minivan. Right. And I wanted to fucking rule the world. Yes. It didn't work out. Yes. You and, know what I mean? I had goals of ruling the world and she wanted to raise three kids. Sure. You know, when I divorced her, I think she had three kids within four years. What's yeah. that fucking tell you? Sure. She wanted a family. Yeah. I didn't want kids. It's yep. not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. We just weren't yoked the same. Yes. And that was with us, like, I, same thing. I wanted to rule the world, and he yep. was happy just coasting and living a calm, Com comfortable life. And there's nothing wrong no, with that. No, there's not. There's nothing, like, honestly, As I've got older, I've actually envied that a little bit. I'm like, more power to you, honestly. Yes. Like, you're not getting drove crazy 24-7, and I, I would be crazy doing that, but more power to you, you know, that you're comfortable with that. But, um, so anyway, so I left, had somebody come pick all my stuff up. I have a car. Two studs, two or three studs. I think I had three studs at that point. And I let him have the place, the equipment. I was like, you know what? That's fair. You have that. I'll have the studs. You know, Let's move on. all good. We, well, I was like, I'm not spending a bunch of money on lawyers, right? Yeah. So we move on. So I go to Jaffs, who um, is very good to me and lets me, him and Amber, his wife, let me live in the intern's house at the ranch. The intern, what was the name of that stallion station? The Ranch Equine. The Ranch Equine. It's called what it's called. And so the intern house is just what you think an intern house would be. Like it's a it, shithole. It's a shithole. Yeah. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a shithole. So I, like, am like, okay, well, so I go from living in this big house to, like, having this big, cool place to living in a shithole. I don't nothing. And it's a restart, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, but that's okay. Like, How it's, old are you? I'm 25, okay. so I'm like, it's a restart time, and it's time to get to work. Yep. So time to get hungry again. Time to get to work. So yep. I bring one girl with me that was a great girl. She was a really, she, she worked for me, but I was probably like a mother figure to her. Yeah. Like she was, a and she, me and her hooked up, and we worked. Like we yep. got after it. So we spent six months working a lot. Yep. I don't, more than 12 hours a day. Yep. And, um bought and sold a lot of horses had to i lost my facebook page which was a big deal it was low rants horses i had like a hundred thousand followers i lost it and mm. that was part of it like he was like you're not keeping the facebook page and finally yeah. you're just like that's fine whatever yeah. you know then it's off. it's fine and so um i make solo select and i decide to call it solo select because i'm a woman and i have to be salty you know yeah, and so i'm yeah. like it's solo like, i don't yeah. need it you know so yeah. i so I, ever, I wish i had a really cool story about why it's called solo but it's really because i was a little salty after i got married nothing wrong portion. with that and yeah, i said and i can let do me tell it you a little bit about being salty <laughs> a little bit of saltiness and bitterness <laughs> is a good fucking energy for dry yes yes let me tell you most of my career the energy i've got to do what I've done is coming from shoving it up people's asses. Because mm -hmm. when I got to America, everybody said I was just a dumb fucking Australian. I was never going to be a clinician. I was never going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I fucking made it. Yes. Then they said, wow, that clinician bullshit, that'll work with those quarter horses. It won't work with a thoroughbred. So I went and got a thoroughbred off the track, trained the motherfucker on RFD TV, yep. made it famous. Yep. Oh, that should have worked with that. But you can't get a wild horse. I went to a middle of <laughs> Australia, got a 10 year old wild stallion, the never seen man, filmed it live. Over 10 oh days gosh. and got that motherfucker broke and, and, and made a big TV series of it. I use that fuel. Yes. The haters that hate on me, I never want them to stop. Yes. Ever. Yep. Because it's that hate that they get for me that fuels me to prove them wrong.
Well, that so that what I'm getting at a little bit of that saltiness there. Yeah. That's a good fucking thing. You want a little salt rubbed in the wound because yeah. when you get a little salt rubbed in your wound, it makes you want to kick somebody's ass. Sure. And the one thing I'll point out with that that I've really noticed because I've had to start from zero twice. Yes. And, and which I'm fine with. No yes. complaints. I wouldn't do it a different way. But um, everybody roots for you on the way up. Oh but, yeah. But when you get there, oh, they don't like you then. They don't. <laughs> yes. She, she, she must have a backer. She must have a trust fund. She must have gotten oh, yeah. a couple million dollars when she got a divorce. America it is. is what I call. It's real weird. America. <laughs> tell you what America is. Australia is the same way, really. America fucking loves the underdog. Yes. Why do you think Rocky One so popular? Yeah. Rocky Two. But once you become successful. Typically, they hate your guts as a culture. 100%. Like, Australia is a funny country. Australia have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome. I don't know where this name came from, but it's basically, if you're, re if you're doing really well in life, financially or in life, they want to knock you down. Yep. They hate somebody climbing up. A, you know, when one crab tries to climb out of the bucket, the other crabs grab its legs and yes. pull it back down. So they call it the po uh, tall poppy syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they hate people doing fucking well and they drag them down as a culture, okay? It's like Steve Irwin. When Steve Irwin was alive, okay, most people in Australia thought he was an idiot. Yeah. Seriously. They, they, because Steve, the way Steve talked on those TV shows, Australians don't fucking talk like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, crikey, what the fuck are you doing? You know, they right. don't talk like the way he talked. It was, a, it was an act for a TV, mm -hmm. okay? And he was very good at what he did, sure. okay? But when he was alive, a lot of Australians didn't like him. They thought he was a joke. They thought he was a, a, a kind of an embarrassment. The Australians don't talk like that. He's on the Discovery Channel. He's made all this fucking money, blah, blah, blah. Here's what's funny. As soon as the poor bastard dies, he's a national fucking hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always joke about that. Yeah. The, the, when you, how, here's how you get famous. Just fucking die. Yep. Once you die, everybody loves you. Yep. So now that he's dead, you go to Australia and say, how, what do you think of Steve? Oh, he's an Australian icon. Yeah. Greatest Australian that ever lived. I swear to God, I want every kid of mine to be like Steve Irwin. Oh, I love him. I cry every time his anniversary comes around. You lying sacks of dog shit. <laughs> You lying sacks of dog shit. When he was alive, everybody fucking hated him. Yeah. Now that he's dead, he's the greatest national hero in the world. Right. A little bit of that is like what's here. Yes, it is. When you're the, the underdog, industry, everybody fucking loves you. Yeah. You know, when I, uh, when I had not won Road to the Horse, everybody was for the poor, broke Australian. Yes. Once you win it a couple of times, you're a rich asshole. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. So I get that. That's yeah. just culture. But sure. again, I used it as fuel. Yep. And I still use it as fuel. Mm -hmm. So... When you become successful, Melanie, and people hate on you, use it as a badge of honor. It's mm -hmm. a badge of pride because mm -hmm. people don't hate on losers. Yep. Never forget what I just yep. said. People don't hate on losers. Yep, absolutely right. People hate on winners. Yes. Not everybody, of course, because there's a lot of people. I'm one of them. When somebody's kicking ass, I love that they're kicking ass. Yes. It inspires me. That's what this whole podcast was for, mm -hmm. was to bring people on here that were kicking ass mm -hmm. in life and money and business and life. And show them off. Hey, yeah. you can kick ass. Sure. Be like these people. Right. Don't hate on them. Be great. Right. So I, I'm a bit of a weird duck like that, that I love positive people and love mm -hmm. inspiration from other people. I get energy from people that are doing well. Yes. But if you think everybody's going to love you when you're successful, you'll be, you'll be very much disappointed. But see, the reason why you want to be hated is because the second you're not hated, you're a has-been. Yes. The second you're not hated, you're not relative anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when Pat Pirelli was at his biggest. When I first got to America, I'm a distant fifth or sixth on the clinician rank, and this motherfucker's number one. Him and Monty Roberts are number one. You couldn't say Monty Roberts' name or Pat Pirelli's name without it, people hating him. Hating. Hating with yes. a passion. Absolutely. You, and I, I couldn't do a clinic without Pat Pirelli's name coming up. Yes. If I did an expo, TV show, anything I did... Oh, Pat, 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 mm -hmm. Pat. Do you know how much I hear Pat's name now? Zero. Right. Zero. Right. You want to be hated forever because when you're hated, you're number one. Yeah. When you're not number one and you're a has-been, nobody gives a shit about you anymore. Yeah. So I embrace the hate. In yep. fact, I want them to keep doing it because it does two things for me. It tells me that I'm relative and two, it gives me fuel to prove I'm fucking wrong. Yes. Absolutely. So just keep that in mind about hate there. Yes. You now, again, some of the comments people make and shit that they say, it can stab a little bit. But it but usually the, reflects on them. Yeah, but just remember you know? something. 
you don't want to be not hated on yeah. because the opposite is a has been. Yes. Nobody fucking hates on the has been. Yep. They hate on the guy making a ton of money. Yeah. They hate on the guy that's successful or girl in your mm -hmm. case. So just a little bit of mentor advice for you. Just yep. always remember it's a badge of honor when they're hating on you. Yes. So keep going. You're starting over. You're hustling. You're making money again. So then I, um, you know, start selling horses, get solo select built. You know, yep. I have a lot of great followers from low ranch horses that come to it, you know, and it, it, it does hit me a little bit losing that because I had a big following on there yep. and it's gone. So I start a Facebook group with zero and I'm like, gosh, how dang. quickly did they come over? It took a took year and a while. half, yeah. two yeah. years. I mean, it, to really get them. I mean, my, my tried and true people that followed me, I yeah. like sent an email out to all of them and said, this is what's happening. And I was very respectful. This yeah. is what's happening. John and I have decided to yeah. split ways, you know. Um, I highly recommend them for training. If you want to send any horses over here, yada, yada, yeah, yada. Yeah, you did the right So thing. anyways, um, so we get through all that, and I'm finally kind of rolling again. Like, I've got myself a truck bought. I buy a trailer, so I, and, you know, I'm rolling again. And so then um, I buy a little place that needs a lot of work. It's like 30 acres. It's, um, you know, it, it needs work. But I know I can afford it, and then I can... Fix as it. I go, pay out of pocket to improve it, right? So I start doing that. That goes well. The breeding is taking off. You know, it's I'm hiring more people. I get somebody, a secretary in the office. Things are going really good. Yeah. Okay, so then one day, I've got this place pretty good now, but I've only got 60 stalls. And I'm back to just like I was when I had 12 stalls. I've got horses tied out. I've got playing board at other places. Like, I've outgrown yeah. this place. And so one day, I'm just like, I, I need a bigger place. So yeah. I drive, and, and at that point, I'm starting to get interested in the real estate. I bought 20 acres next to me, and I'm like, this real estate is like, it's when it's just starting to take off. This has been about three years ago. And I'm like, it's really taken off. Like, I think there's money to be made in it, you know? But but it's a little bit foreign because I'm like, well, I gotta get a loan for it. And my parents were always like, you never wanna be in debt. And I'm like, oh, I don't know yeah. about that. You know, that makes me nervous. And I'm like, well, somebody's making money do it that people have made money doing it and i'm yeah. like starting to watch these TikToks about real estate and they're like yeah you can put 20 percent down improve on the house pull your 20 percent back out put it back in something else and i'm like okay like i can <laughs> i can get with this so yeah. i'm like okay so i want to start doing the real estate so i'll get my real estate license and i'm like i then i can sell some real estate here and there and i can back all mine up three percent and in the process i can kind of learn the the language and about it well, then my realtor friend, Linda, she's Linda Weaver from, mm -hmm. she's, she's a terrible influence. Mm -hmm. She's like, there's this ranch down in Lake Iowa and you need to go look at it. I was like, okay, I'm going right now. <laughs> so I'd pull in there and I'm like, yeah, like this, this is, is it. This is it. You like pull in, it's down a paved road. And I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. Like people, people ask me occasionally, if you weren't what you did for a living, what else would you have done for a living? Mm -hmm. And honestly, if I could go back to a 20 year old Clinton, you know what I'd say now, I would have got into real estate. Yep, yep. I would have been a realtor. Mm -hmm. If I could have had the same passion, key mm -hmm. word now, mm -hmm. passion and work ethic for selling real estate the way I had for You'd down be under a billionaire. horsemanship, I'd be a fucking billionaire. You would be. I would have been a billionaire. Yeah. I was very pr pr proud and prideful that I got to retire at 43 with millions in the horse industry. That's fucking unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of in this industry. Yes. Most people work their whole lives off just to barely make enough to retire. Just to pay for their place. To pay for their place. I got retired at 43. So it's a bad, yeah, am I proud of it? You're damn right I am because it's unheard of. But if I could have done what I did outside of horses mm -hmm. and picked another industry like real estate, Holy, you know, I'd be riding a G6 right now. Well, you know I, what I mean? It's, it's, horses is a hard industry well, to make a lot of money for. The thing about horses that that is fine, but that makes me see the future of that we can only get so big in it, is you are one so labor intensive. Yes. You cannot, a horse business is not like other businesses. Like I can't just say, okay, I've got my horse business running and go off and do something else. You babysit. It's it. like an old school dairy farm. Yeah. Somebody's got to pull those titties. Yes. Somebody's got to be milking those cows. Yes. It's it's not like they milk themselves. And, so. and then I'm like, also, everybody has real estate. Yeah. Okay. A small population has horses. Yes. But everybody needs somewhere to live. That's okay. Exactly so right. we've open so we can get in the real estate and there's everybody needs something to do with real estate. Very yeah. point one percent of people need something to do with horses. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I think I wanna start kind of 
like I want to keep in the horse business, but I want to start mm -hmm. moving into this. Anyway, so I'm pulling this ranch. And I'm like, I gotta have it. Once again, I'm like, I have no idea how I'm gonna afford it, you know. <laughs> but I'm like, I it's mandatory. Yes. Like you pull in and it's you've been to it, and it mm -hmm. has a lot of eye appeal. Oh, like it's when beautiful. you pull, it's a beautiful place. And I'm just like, I don't know, how I'm gonna pay for it, but I gotta have it. And at this point, I have a banker that I have a pretty good relationship with. So I called Dustin. I'm like, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but um, I need to buy this place. So just what do what do you need? Like firstborn kid, kidneys, <laughs> what? Whatever. I don't care. So my ovaries. I already, what do you need? I put it into contract today and there's no option period. So figure out a way to finance yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. And so anyway, so then I'm like, okay, so I've got it in contract. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to auction some pieces of my land off. That's like, awesome. so I'm like, I think I can like divide it up into seven pieces and I'll just sell whatever we'll sell. And if it all sells, that's great. And if it doesn't, I'll just gather up a little bit of money and that way I can pay the down payment on that one. Mm -hmm. And then I'll figure out how to pay the payment. So I'm like, okay. So we did this auction on this place and it's freaking unbelievable. Yeah. Like it was just you timed it perfectly. perfect storm. Yeah. It was luck. I would love to say I just knew it was just the right yeah. time. I had no idea. Okay. It just was perfect timing. Yeah. And so we sell this land that for 50,000 an acre and it, that is unheard of on 377 yeah. still. Now it's normal, but yeah. that was right at the beginning when it was really hitting. So it all works out. I get the place bought. And that starts when I split that land up and it does good. Then it's like the next drug I found. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because for you as a red, remember it's a challenge. It was challenging, you, you, yes. By the sounds of it, you've kind of met most of the goals you wanted for the horse industry. Yes. And you've done it long enough now that you've 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 accomplished all a lot of your goals by the sounds of it. You've yes. mastered the skill set. Yes. And that's the hardest thing for people like me and you is repetitively doing the same skill set. I get bored to you death. You get bored to death. Yes. So that's why the real estate's so appealing to you. And I've right. told you off camera that make all the money from the horse industry and then put it into real estate. Yes. That's what I did. Yes. People ask why I moved to Northwest Arkansas because this is the money out here, the real estate. Right. People laugh about Arkansas. Walmart World Headquarters, JB Hunt Trucking, Tyson Chicken. Yep. Tyson Chicken's the largest protein supplier of the world. Those three billion dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies, are all within 30 minutes of where I live. Mm -hmm. So there's thousands of employees that drive rental homes. So I right. put all my money into rental homes, commercial mm -hmm. real estate. Mm -hmm. And I moved here three years ago and invested. Right. So what do you think that's done in the last oh, three years? I've up. made so much more money in real estate out here in the last three years than what I did 10 years being on the road being a clinician. Yes. So, so I and moved And you here. haven't had to do anything. No, That's the key. I, I came here for a reason. Yeah. People thought I was, you know, people thought I was crazy coming to Arkansas. Northwest Arkansas is a hub of money. Just mm -hmm. that our Northwest Arkansas is a, is a, a topia of money right here. Mm -hmm. And that's why I went here is for real estate. So, and that's why I, another reason why I got into real estate long ago too, not just now, I wanted my money out of equine. Yes. And I tell you why I wanted it out of equine. One, I was fucking burnt out mm -hmm. and I'd had enough. And two, I never wanted, I, I, not never, I was tired of being fucking leveraged by people. Yes. I was tired of being leveraged by customers. If I said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, we're not going to buy your shit no more. Mm -hmm. We're going to, you know, you know, they call it canceled now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always had that thread over my head that if yes. I didn't tow the line, I was going to be canceled, going to be threatened, you know. So I said, as soon as I can get all my money together, I want this shit out of equine. Yep. So that if equine tells me to fuck off or I don't want to do it anymore, I'm not leveraged. Yes. That's why I did this podcast. Yep. That's why I am the way I am. I've always been this way. People sure. say, well, why does he talk the way he does and language and all this shit? I've always spoke like this off camera the way I am to my friends and people. I've, I've never changed in 25 years, mm -hmm. except when I was on RFD TV, I had the Tova line. Right. I was RFD TV's bitch. Right. I had to say certain things, act a certain way, do a certain thing. Yeah. I was their fucking dancing monkey. Yeah. For 15 years, I had to do what Patrick told me to fucking do. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I hated it, mm -hmm. hated every part of it. So I knew as soon as I could get my money together, I want off. Right. I want to cut loose of the shackles and fucking handcuffs and I want to just be me. Yep. And that's why I get to do it now. Right. Right. You know, there was a lady on Facebook, we put something on Facebook the other day and, and she said, I'm tired of him and his mouth, I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> and I just chuckled and I thought to myself, lady, don't let the door hit you in the no ass on the kidding. way out. Yeah. But see, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have had to panic over that. Yes. Oh my God, I, what if she unfollows me? What if she yeah. doesn't buy my halter? What, oh my God, I, she, had so much, she had so much power over me. Sure. 
And I fucking hated that. Yep. As Reds, personalities, we hate being leveraged. Yes, We absolutely. hate people grabbing us by the short and curlies and jerking us around. Yes. We hate being owned. Yes. So but as soon as I could get all my money together and get it into real estate, get it into things that are non-equine, I could do this. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep doing this, but I'm going to be me. And the people that love me will support me. And the people who hate my guts will move on. Yeah. But typically they don't move on. They keep watching anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, but I could just do it for fun now. Yes. That's why I do this is for fun. Yes. I don't have to make money at it. And, and it's a relief. Right. So that's what I told you is get, get your money out of and you have. You have and get it into it real estate. Me. Yes. So, but, and then, and if you want to do real estate, if you want to do horses in 10 years from now, it's because you want to do it. Exactly. Not because you have to do it. Right. So you got the new place bought, mm -hmm. okay. What's your next goal then? So you, you've got your studs up and running. You, you, you're the height of success now. You mm -hmm. proved me wrong. I never would have guessed in a million years um, that, let, let's touch on a little bit, especially the thing that, here's the thing that intrigues me about your business model, but I think is so fucking smart on your end and, and that most people in the horse industry don't get. As at least, uh, when I say horse industry, I'm talking about performance horses, quarter mm -hmm. horses, reining, cutting, and cow horse, okay? Everybody wants to make money from that upper level, that real high-end two-year-old, right. that real high-end brood mare, right. the $100,000, $200,000 horse. That's where the, all the glory is and where they think all the money is. But they don't want to fuck with that $3,500 4H mare. Yeah. They don't want to fuck with the little guy down the below. Right. One thing that's, that intrigued me and I thought was so smart about your business model you made money from everybody, from yes. the kid that has a 4-H pony all the way through to the million-dollar fertility horse. Yes. Very few people in the Western performance industry ever got that. In yes. fact, I don't think any. Yeah. I made money from people that didn't know how to put a halter on. Mm -hmm. And that was really where my bread and butter came from. The right. real green novice horse person is where I, I'm, I took a little bit of money of fucking thousands of people. Yep. Not big chunks of money off a few. Right. And so I really, I would, I never looked down on that. A lot of people yeah. in the Western industry sure. look down on dealing with that $3,500 4 H pony for the kid. Mm -hmm. That's below me. Fuck, I'd gather that shit up all day. Yep. I want some of that warm up money. Yep. I want a little bit of money off thousands of customers. That's yes. how I made my money. But you were smart enough to make money from the little guy getting in that doesn't know any better, like you and your parents. And you take money from every level to the top end. Because one thing that people don't know, a lot of people new to the horse industry don't realize about the horse industry, in my opinion, is there's different levels to it. Mm -hmm. So you've got your basic person like you and your parents were, mm -hmm. you know, call it level one. Yes. 4-H, barely getting started, don't know how to get a saddle. Sure. Then you've got your, your like your 4-H level. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Maybe a little few little open bow races, little open horse shows. Then you've got your regional horse shows, you know, mm -hmm. you show within your area or your state. Yep. And then you've got your next level where you're showing in multiple states. Mm -hmm. And then you show on kind of your open world-class level national shows. Yep. And each level of the horse industry is a ton of money to be made. Yes. But you've got to be willing to cater to what that customer needs from every single level right. of that. Right. You don't look down on that. Whether the lady wants to buy a $1,000 horse mm -mm. or the guy wants to buy $300,000 stud to breed to his mares, you'll happily do business with them. Sure. Which I thought was very smart. And honestly, as bad as it is to say, I don't think a lot of people in the Western industry would have done what you did. Yeah, we, I do sell horses that, like in our sale this weekend, we sold, you know, a mare, a little four-year-old show mare for 80,000, and we sold some thoroughbred mares with a breed and a Tic Tac for 3,500. That's what I mean. I mean, and we're fine with that. Yes, everybody's money's Everybody green. can play. Everybody can play. Yes. Key word right yes. there. Yes, everybody, everybody can play. Everybody can play in your sand pit. Yes, and I want them to. Like, yes. I appreciate but those you, people But you'll be amazed, well, you wouldn't be, but I'm amazed at how many people in the Western horse industry look down on that $3,500 yes. man. Yes, yes. They want, they want mess with But them. I started there, right? Yes, So yes. I understand yeah. where they're Good coming from you yes. know so yes. i can i can resonate with those people where not no offense to some of these people but they've started out with their parents were million dollar riders they don't want to jack with that so let me ask you the traditional horse sale is you go to the horse sale there's an auction there's bidders you stand around put your number up yep. okay you've changed that now with online sales 
do you think it's going to stay there? Do you think the old-fashioned horse sale with raising your hand a bit on a horse, do you think that is a dying breed? Is it always going to be there? Do you think it's going to die completely? In the next 10 years, again, 10 years ago, I would have bet you a million dollars, Melanie, that your business model of selling horses online was not going to work. Right. Where's it going 10 years from now? I think that in 10 years, the, like how two years ago to have a on, like there's a lot of online sales coming right now. So there's a lot so of people. So you feel like a lot of people are copying your oh, business model. Oh, a hundred percent. There, every day a new on, everybody thinks they can have an online sale. Yeah. Okay. One, most of them don't survive because nobody realizes how much work it really is. Yes. Um, but there will be some that do. Yes. You know, yes. that's part of it. Yeah. And, um, but the, I think in 10 years, the in-person sales will be like an online sale was two years ago. Like they'll be like, man, that's really cool. Have you seen that online sale? Like there's not very many of them. Well, I think online sales are going to take over in, ten, in the next 10 years, the majority of horse sales. And I think it will be cool. Like it will be an event to have an in-person horse sale. Mm. It's funny. It's like, okay. So like, you know how when, especially in the last 10 years, magazines have taken a big shit. Yes. Equine magazines. Like yes. when I got over here, that's how you got promoted. Yeah. You're either in an equine magazine, Horse Illustrated, Western Horseman, or you were did a horse expo, yep. equine affair, whatever. Okay. This is long before RFD TV, the internet was taken off, YouTube, all that mm -hmm. shit, okay? And so magazines were a dying breed and they died off more and more and more. If you look at the the magazines, they got thinner and, mm -hmm. thinner, and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. You know, guys like me were spending $750,000 a year on print advertising. Now I don't even spend 10,000 a year. Sure. But here's what I noticed though. As it died off, if you're willing to create a magazine that's so much better than everything else and so much different, mm -hmm. it takes a hold. So you've seen my No Worries Journal. Yes. It's like a high-end, we copied like high-end yachting. That's where yep. I got the idea. Yep. I got, I subscribed to a million quote-unquote magazines from all different industries, mm -hmm. from fashion to, to yachting to planes. Mm -hmm. And I took that idea from there is that it's a really high-end journal. It is the most high-end for people that haven't seen it. Yes. In the horse industry right now. It's, it's nothing in the horse industry even comes close to it. I, I mean, I love Western Horsemen, Court Horsemen. Yeah. They're not even close. Yes. Not even close. So, but I sell that with a $40, $40 membership. Right. With your $40 membership, you get four of these journals a year. Right. But it smells good. It yeah. feels good. It's heavy. Yeah. It's quality. It's expensive photography. Yeah. It, because even though magazines are disappearing, people still like to touch something. Mm -hmm. Smell Especially something. Especially in feel the something. older group of people yes. you know yes. my group is still happy to do it online but you get a little older and they want to touch it and feel it and see it yes but it stands out yes so what i'm saying is 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 a, a, when, when you will eventually stand out because you'll have an elite mm -hmm. online sale but right. if you do one in person if you do put a sale on mm -hmm. i do believe what you just said it'll yeah. stand out well and i think like western bloodstock it, there's not going to be in my opinion you cannot get the same feel you get at their two-year-old sale yes that's never going to go away yes it, it's going to be a strong sale forever that that mm -hmm. elite sale no different than you just said it, it's elite right yes. so that western bloodstock maturity sale and staff but maturity sale it's here to stay yeah but like i think that a lot of these little horse cells that have regional. 400 horses are regional mm. they're they're gonna go there's it's just so easy to put them online yeah i mean it's just easy yeah so yeah. you don't have to drive to the horse yeah. cell anyway so I so think let's let's do this then um if you could wave a magic wand where mm -hmm. do you want to see yourself in 10 years from now any wands you want you make up whatever fucking story you want where uh, would you like to be i would like to have a significant amount of commercial real estate like okay. that's my goal so i've been buying rv parks mm -hmm. and apartment buildings mm -hmm. and things like that i dig it it's interesting to me still and like in my mind those notes are paid off in 10 to 20 years and yep. they're just mailbox money yep. so in my mind i want to have that and i still want to have this horse business but i only want to cater to the customers a lot yeah like if i don't like you or you want to yep. be a pain you're gone yes. you know i love working i still really do love working with great customers yes. like i'm not burnt out on it yet yes. you know i'm still in the spot in my life where i really enjoy that so I would think in 10 years, I, I just want to have the best mares mm -hmm. for the best customers, have the best horses on the online sale and enjoy it. Like yes. back off the numbers a little bit and just enjoy it and then have a lot of real estate. That's the goal. I mean, I love the real estate and it, I'm trying as, you know, as much as possible to buy it up. Yes, and, and, learn, so that, about and learn about it. Yeah. And I've made some mistakes and I'm yeah. going to continue just like this and 
but I sh that's where I really want to be. So if you could go back to uh, a 20 year old Melanie um, and uh, what would you, t what, what do you think some of the greatest lessons you've learned? Like for me personally is I never paid enough attention to the money. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty common fact. I had a lot of money stolen from me, yeah. a lot of money embezzled. I didn't pay attention to the money and, and I did fine, but I could have retired with 20 times more money if right. I would have really paid attention to the money. Yep. Um, that was my life lesson, regret. I was way too trusting with money. Yes. What will you think that at your age, and you're 29, you're not that old yet, but if you could go back and give yourself some advice from what you've learned from 20 to 29, what would you say? I would say the biggest thing I've learned is everybody wants to grow up in this, kind of what we talked about earlier, they have this fantasy world of, you know, um, just like getting married or mm -hmm. really doing all that. Like, and I did, and I appreciate that my parents pushed me to try to go get an education and all that. But if I could do it again, would I do that? I wish I would have done just what I wanted to do. Yeah. I wasted four years and $40,000 in that school. And I only great thing I can say I got out of it was a best friend. Like yeah. I, the girl I'm is my very best friend came from there. Um, but gosh, if I could go back and do it again, I would have gone to school for business or nothing and yeah. just done the horse business. And I did that because that's what society told me I was supposed to that's do, right. you know, and I wish that I would have listened to what Melanie wanted to do. Yes. You know, and that doesn't mean if Melanie said go party every night, that's what I should have done. Yes. You know, but you don't want to sound cheesy and say follow your heart. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But do what you want to do, not what mom and dad tell you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. Well, I left high school at 15, and that shocks a lot of people, and it should. I never graduated high school, went to college, but I left high school at 15. And you know, the only people that supported me actually in leaving were my parents. Yeah guidance counselor. I would take American horse magazines into the guidance counselor at high school and say, this is what it's like. Yeah. You know, I could not get people to believe that this was, everybody believed that this was just a, a high school crush. You know yes. what I mean? That you're going to grow out of horses Absolutely. and blah, blah, blah. And I know some people do. And I'd take American magazines in and show the guidance counselor and say, hey, this is an industry. People make money from this. This is mm -hmm. not just a hobby. And I couldn't get anybody to be on board. And the only people that actually were on board were my parents, believe it or not. They were the only ones that supported leaving me high school at 15. Mm -hmm. And a couple of reasons why. They knew where I was going. I was going to be a man overnight. Mm -hmm. I went to the middle of the fucking outback, basically, <laughs> and worked with a 65-year-old man 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. So I wasn't going to go party. I was right. going to grow up real fucking quick. Yep and learn to work hard and get out of a, a high school kid's mind mm -hmm. and into the adult world very, very quickly. But they also know, knew that I was just passionate about it. I wasn't passionate about anything else. Yes. This is what I dreamt about doing, thought about doing. Yes. It was the only thing that I actually thought I could be great at. Mm -hmm. I was always an average athlete. I was always a uh, below average student. I was average to below average at everything in my life, okay? Mm -hmm. But when I found horses, I was like, okay, motherfucker, if you're willing to work hard enough and strive hard enough and sacrifice hard enough, you could actually be really good at this mm -hmm. shit. So that lit a fire for me. Yes. And they encouraged me to leave. Now, would I encourage a 15-year-old kid to leave high school now? The answer would be no, okay. Uh, but I think they were also smart enough that when you find red personalities like me and you, we're parents the worst nightmare. Oh, that That's we don't listen we to anything. They we don't you. listen to anything. Yeah. When you have a red child, and if you want to know what I'm talking about, look up the color code yep. on the internet. Yep. A guy called Taylor Hartman, look up the color code. Reds, I never had children because I was frightened to death I'd have a red kid like me. Yeah. And they would put me in the grave early. Because yeah. we don't listen. We're bullheaded. We never stop. We only want what we want. Uh, we won't listen. We're just belligerent. But <laughs> we will get what we want, yeah. no matter what. <laughs> Part of me, I joke about it, but I actually fucking think it's true. I think my parents just wanted me left. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really, when it comes down just, to it, I think at 15, my dad looked at my mother and he said, have you had enough of this little asshole? Yeah. And she said, yes. You just wear and them out. And they just gone. Yeah. And, that, and I got down the road. Clinton's grabbing a cocktail and we'll be right back. Get yourself one and enjoy this short clip. It's the struggle that makes it real. When I got here... I didn't have a plan B. There's no inheritance for me. There's no big trust fund. There's no money there. Okay. So I had to act like, okay, I'm, I've got to have enough money put away for retirement. How am I going to get this done? There's no plan B here. And that's, that's what they're lacking. Most of the kids now, they're just heartless little pricks because they're given every fucking thing. 
toughen them up. When I was when I was making money, when I was 10, 11, 12 making money, my parents made me and my sister pay board. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't a lot. It was like like 25% of whatever we made. So if it was $10, they took $2.50 out of it. Yeah. It was the lesson about no nothing's free, motherfucker. See this roof over your head? See the lights? It all costs money. So from a very early age, our parents taught me and my sister, nothing's for free. Pay up. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So, so even though we didn't make a lot, they took 25% of it. But it got me thinking, nothing, there's no free ride. So by the time I left high school at 15, I wasn't expecting a free ride. Well, listen, I've really thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you. I've learned a lot of stuff that uh, I haven't, didn't know before. You know, we, me and you have become close since our good mentor, Doug Carpenter, died a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny how when Doug died, a lot of his friends, we all got to know each other yes. a lot more directly. We might have known each other from afar, right. but we got very close when Doug died, and, and you're one of them and, and many other people as well. But... I think the biggest thing that I want people to see from this interview is that you're a young kid, didn't come from horse parents, didn't come from money, but you had passion, you mm -hmm. had drive, you were willing to start at the bottom, yep. cleaning stalls, you didn't yep. give a fuck, you did yep. it with a great attitude. Yes. You wanted a chance to start. Yes. And now at 29, I, I don't know your bank statement, but I sure as shit bank, you're making as much as me or more Mm -hmm. And you're making a lot of fucking money, and I'm proud of you for that. And that's great to do. And you, you, you all, my horses that don't work in my performance industry go through your sales. Yes. I put them there for a reason. Yep. When they, they don't have the talent, they're nice horses, but they don't have the talent. Yep. They go through your sales, and you mm -hmm. represent them well yep. and do a phenomenal job. So if you're 29, what I'm proud of with you is that by the time you get to 47 my age, I'll be asking you for a loan. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, I hope it's zero percent interest. I'll, pro I'll probably be having to make sure the nursing home takes care of you. Uh, just that's all I need. Just make yeah. sure that bitch power washes me at lukewarm yeah, water. Yeah, that's probably what my job will be. You know be, what I'm I mean? Guessing. If I, you're so far ahead of me, Melanie, than where I was at 29, you're so far ahead of me uh, with your money and finances and and business model than what I even was at 29. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But the sure. biggest thing I will tell you is, is end on this: is watch the money. Yep. Be careful, big is not always better. Yes. There is a line that when you cross it, you actually lose money. I hate money. when you tell me that, I just, but I know you're right. But it's right. You're because right. I, I never had somebody pumping the brakes on I me. I know. I was fucking full out, flat to the floor. I'm going to rule the world. Yes. And it almost bankrupted me and crippled me. Yep. It, it almost let me go back to Australia with a bridle and $400. And a pair of boots. Yes. That's how much it almost crippled me. So that's yep. why I'm a little, you know, that's why I tell you that. But you're on the right track. But if anybody listening to this or watching it says, how do I make money? You're a living proof of it. You can, that's why I love yeah. this country so yes. much. If you have drive, desire, everything you've done to make money, here's a common denominator. You saw a need for it. Yes. You saw something that wasn't being met and you met that need. Mm -hmm. You saw a service that wasn't done good enough and you made a better service. Yes. That's why capitalism is the greatest thing in America. It's what makes this whole world go around and especially America is that you can show up poor and end up rich, yep. but you have to be ballsy, you have to take risk, you have to work excessive hours, you have to have passion mm -hmm. and you have to have see something that you can do better mm -hmm. and do it somewhere else. So. Yes. Cheers to you. Thank you. I'm very proud of Thank you. Thank you. And I hope people that are listening to this know and watch and admire you and what you're doing at Solo Select yep. and say, I can do it too. If she yes. did it from a, a kid with no horse background yep. and doing it at 29 and dominating the way you're doing it financially mm -hmm. and in the industry, mm -hmm. anybody can do it and I'm yes. proud of you. That's exactly right. Cheers, Thank mate. you. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Today's episode was filmed at and produced by Intercut Productions. Marketing by Stuart and Associates and organized and administrated by Down Under Horsemanship. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time, mate. Cheers.